when the British took firm control of the Southern Cape Colony by 1806, they continuously expanded their territorial hold, expanding into South Africa. These encroachments were often met with resistance by the native tribes, primarily the Zulu nation, forged into one kingdom by the legendary Shaka Zulu in 1816, until his death on September 28, 1828. One of the many outposts held by the Europeans was a small Swedish mission and hospital called Rourke's Drift. A battle would soon occur there that would define bravery. Why was Rourke's Drift considered important to the British? Why did 4,000 Zulu warriors go on the warpath and want to destroy it? How did 154 men withstand such an intense battle and win? You're all going to die! Die! Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, former soldier, Marine Corps scout sniper, history professor, historian and book author, and we will answer these questions and other issues on this segment of Forgotten History. Rourke's Drift was the former trading post of James Rourke, a merchant from the Eastern Cape of Irish descent, known as Kwajimu, or Jim's Land, to the Zulus. It was a mission station of the Church of Sweden. It was a critical route connecting other British outposts, as well as a line of supply and communication located near a drift, or ford, on the Buffalo River, which at the time formed the border between the British colony of Natal and the Zulu Kingdom. On January 9, 1879, the British No. 3 Center Column under Lord Frederick Augustus Thesiger, 2nd Baron Chelmsford, arrived and temporarily encamped at Rourke's Drift. Rourke's Drift was a small station manned by 154 men of the British Army under Lieutenants John Rouse Marriott Chard of the Royal Engineers and Gonful Bromhead of the 24th Regiment of Foot. Another 250 personnel, workers, and couriers were also involved. They were under the overall command of Brevet Major Henry Spaulding, the 104th Regiment of Foot, a member of Chelmsford's staff. On January 11th, Chelmsford's column left for Isandlwana and crossed the river and encamped on the Zulu bank. A small force consisting of B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, under Lieutenant Bromhead, was to remain at Rourke's Drift and garrison the post. Soon thereafter, two survivors from Isandlwana, from the Natal Carboneers, arrived, informing Chard of the slaughter at Isandlwana. He had more bad news. A large number of Zulu warriors were approaching the station. At about 3.30 p.m. that day, a mixed troop of about 100 Natal native horse under Lieutenant Alfred Henderson arrived at the station after having arrived from Isandlwana. Tired from the fighting at Isandlwana and the retreat to Rourke's Drift, as well as being short of ammunition, Henderson himself reported to Lieutenant Chard that the enemy were approaching, perhaps an hour away, and that his men would not obey his orders, but they were going off to help Mikar. Outraged at being abandoned, a few British soldiers under Chard fired after them, killing Corporal William Anderson. Nearly a quarter of the soldiers were ill with malaria and dysentery, 39 in total. Learning this news, Chard, Bromhead, and another of the station's officers Acting Assistant Commissary and Transportation Director James Langley Dalton held a meeting to decide what they should do. It was decided that a retreat to help Mekar was out of the question, since traveling in open country and burdened with carts full of hospital patients would be easily overwhelmed by the superior Zulu force. The decision was made to remain and fight, but to do so they had to fortify the compound and create primary and supplemental fallback positions, creating kill zones to channel the enemy into. Finally, after covering 20 miles from their camp in eight hours, the Zulu force crossed the river and reached Rourke's Drift. The Zulus, led by their leader, Prince Dablamanzi Kampande, half-brother of King Keshweo, rounded the Oscarburg and approached the South Wall. This Zulu, part of the force of 600 men, attacked the South Wall, which joined the hospital and the warehouse and the storehouse. The British opened fire when the Zulus were 500 yards away. Surgeon James Reynolds, Color Sergeant Frank Bourne and Reverend George Smith also fired to keep the Zulus away from the patients. The majority of the attacking Zulu force moved around to attack the North Wall, while a few took cover and were either pinned down by continuing British fire or retreated to the base of the Oscarburg. 
There, they began a harassing fire of their own. As this occurred, another Zulu force continued to the hospital and Northwestern Wall. The warriors climbed over the bodies of those killed to reach the roof and enter that way. Those British on the barricades, including Dalton and Bromhead, were soon engaged in fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The British wall was too high for the Zulus to scale, so they resorted to crouching under the wall, trying to get hold of the defenders' Martini Henry rifles. They started slashing at British soldiers with assegais, or firing their weapons through the wall. At places, they clambered over each other's bodies to drive their British off the walls, but were driven back by the intense British fire. Zulu fire, both from those under the wall and around the Oscarburg, inflicted a few casualties, and five of the 17 defenders who were killed or mortally wounded in the action were struck while at the North Wall. The massive but uncoordinated attacks by the Zulu against Rourke's Drift came very close to defeating the much smaller garrison, but they were consistently repelled. But Chard realized that the North Wall, under constant attack, could not be held. At 6 p.m., he ordered his men back into the yard, abandoning the front two rooms of the hospital as Zulu started coming through the walls. The hospital was becoming untenable. The firing ports had become a liability, as rifles poking out were grabbed at by the Zulus. Yet if the holes were left empty, the Zulu warriors stuck their own weapons through the holes in order to fire into the rooms. Of the 11 patients, 9 survived the trip to the barricade, as did all the able-bodied men. According to James Henry Reynolds, 4 defenders were killed in the hospital. One was a member of the Natal native contingent with a broken leg. Sergeant Maxfield and Private Jenkins, who were ill with fever and refused to be moved, were also killed. The evacuation of the burning hospital completed the shortening of the perimeter. Throughout the night, the Zulus kept up a constant assault against the British positions, and the Zulu attacks were reduced only after midnight, ending by 2 a.m., and replaced by harassing fire from Zulu firearms until 4 a.m. By that time, the garrison had 14 dead. Two more were mortally wounded, and eight more, including Dalton, were seriously wounded. There was not a man who did not sustain a wound of some kind, and most were serious. They were all exhausted having fought for the better part of 10 hours and were running low on ammunition. Of 20,000 rounds of ammunition on hand, only 600 rounds remained in some boxes. As dawn broke, the British could see that the Zulus were gone. All that remained were the dead and severely wounded on the ground. Patrols were sent to scout the battlefield, recover rifles, and look for Zulu survivors, many of whom were killed when found. At roughly 7 a.m., a group of Zulus suddenly appeared and the British manned their positions again. However, the Zulus did not attack, suffering many dead and wounded. They had also been on the move for six days prior to the battle and had not eaten or had access to drinking water for a few days. Soon, the Zulus left back across the Buffalo River. Around 8 a.m. another force appeared and the defenders again manned their positions. However, this force turned out to be the vanguard of Lord Chelmsford's relief column. After the battle, 351 Zulu bodies were officially counted within the compound, but it has been estimated that at least 500 wounded and captured Zulus might have been massacred as well. Later numbers state over 600 to 900 were killed when including all the dead Zulu killed by long-range rifle fire before ever reaching the outer walls. 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded among the fortunate defenders, along with a number of other decorations and honors which drew some criticism from government officials. Even today, some academics, who were obviously never soldiers, make the same claim that the men should not have been so decorated. However, Dr. Victor Davis Hanson wrote in his book, Carnage and Culture, quote, Modern critics suggest such lavishness and commendation was designed to assuage the disaster at Asandawana and to reassure a skeptical Victorian public that the fighting ability of the British soldier remained unquestioned. Maybe, maybe not, but in the long annals of military history, it is difficult to find anything quite like Rourke's Drift, where a beleaguered force outnumbered 40 to 1 survived and killed 20 men for every defender lost." End quote. In my personal opinion, the British stand at Rourke's Drift was one of those moments in history where discipline, common sense, tactics, and plain luck won the day. It was the British Alamo, and they won. We hope you enjoyed this segment of Forgotten History. Please click like and subscribe for free 
And please stay tuned and be engaged and informed. Send us comments if you have questions or even show ideas. And we will respond to all requests and comments as soon as we can. Thank you.